Welcome to Crime Beat. I'm Anthony Robart. Tonight, a teen turns up dead near her countryside school. The phone rang and my dad got on the phone and things got very serious. A young girl's body has been found and we think it's your daughter. My father said it was like a bullet going right through the center of his head. You know, it's devastating to hear that you've lost a friend, but it's even worse when they give you a description of how she was found. Unsatisfied with the police investigation, her brother launches a very personal crusade. The things that police were telling my parents were absolutely absurd. I can say for certain that nobody had ever had this happen on their watch at another institution before. They're incompetent. They don't know how to do a criminal investigation. And then over time, I, I began to believe it was more than that. It's the mission that John gave himself. John cannot change nothing about the drama of Teresa, but we can change some, something for other families. He's done a lot in memory of Teresa. I probably wouldn't let it go either. Here now is Dan Spector with the search for Teresa Allure's killer. Life isn't fair, justice is blind and dysfunctional, and some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. This is who killed Teresa. This is John Allure. He's a number cruncher by day, but his real life's work is bringing attention to crimes that have been long forgotten. For decades now, he's researched and profiled unsolved murders, featuring many on his website and podcast, and it was all born out of his sister's death. It's early November 1978 in Quebec's eastern townships, a picturesque area known for its beauty, quaint small towns, rolling farmers' fields. But amidst the calm, an act of violence that will change John's life forever. Do you remember finding out that she'd gone missing? Do you remember what that was like? A, a lot I don't, but that I do. Distinctly, I can still, I can still see it. John's older sister, Teresa, was only 19 when she vanished without a trace. John was 14. I went to this private school and I was hanging up my uniform in my room and my parents came in and told me that Teresa, it probably had been about 10 days, they told me that Teresa was, was missing and that we were all gonna get in the car and, and drive to Quebec to the eastern townships and try to find her. Teresa and John came of age in the suburbs of Montreal, as the city itself was coming into its own. We were in that corridor between Expo 67 and the 76 Montreal Olympics. The Montreal Canadiens were winning, so we got to go to the Forum many, many times and, and, and sit, you know, sometimes in a box, which was a novelty then. 69, we get the Expos, so there we are at Jerry Park. Teresa was just a lot of fun. She's the eldest sibling. I think in any family, when you have the oldest, they're kind of like the trailblazer. And Teresa was adventurous, so we were adventurous. Debbie Ferdinand met Teresa during their first year of high school and did all the things teens do together. It was Led Zeppelin. Oh my God, Bowie. Oh my God, she loved Bowie. <laughs> it was insane saying how much she loved Bowie. She was out of school for a while and, and working some dead-end jobs. So she went to my mother. My mother says she, they, they were driving one day and, and Teresa said to her, if I, if I decided to go back to Sejept, 
just college. How do how would you feel about that? Would would you pay for it? And you know, my mom tells it. She's like she's overjoyed. She's like, of course I'll pay for it. Champlain College shares a campus with Bishop's University in Lenoxville. Bishop's was founded in the 1800s, but Champlain was only a few years old when Teresa arrived in 1978. I taught at Champlain for 36 years, um, from 1973, uh, taught history uh, and humanities, history, humanities and liberal arts. The college was a wonderful place, I mean, very bohemian. Champlain Lenoxville had a, a very bohemian air in the 70s and 80s. The college was new, the student numbers were, were growing uh, rapidly year by year. There was nowhere to put the kids. The residence was nearly 20 kilometers of quiet country road away from the school. King's Hall was available and I think there was literally nothing else within a reasonable radius. This was an adjunct building called Gilliard House and Teresa would have lived in this residence on the, on the second floor, it's like one of these. I recall when we dropped her off here, and it, you know, now you kind of go, woo, but at the time, it was filled with students, filled with promise. Basically what they had was, on an hourly basis, a school bus would pick everyone up, like a school bus, like elementary school, you know, the little yellow thing and drive, what is it, 10 miles in, up into Lenoxville every day. The buses would stop at 6. Uh, I think that there'd be one last call at 10. If you missed a bus, you were out of luck. Kids would hitchhike. There was nothing the college could do to stop kids from doing it. And students, young people are young people. We've hitchhiked all our lives. We spent time sticking our thumbs out and nothing ever happened to us. We never heard of anything happening to any of our friends. We just went along as a bunch of happy kids, trusting people. I think they must have known, administration, that this was a recipe for disaster, putting students in the middle of the countryside, uh, you know, left to their own devices. The last time we saw her, was was Canadian Thanksgiving, you know, which always falls right around her birthday. Teresa was born October 12th. The family, including a 14-year-old John, packed into their car and headed to Lenoxville. We weren't the only ones who came. Friends from Montreal came, and, and, and this friend of hers who's since passed, a guy named Terry Roth, described it best. We're expecting when we arrived, you know, choppers in the air and police presence, and there was just nothing. The local police launched an investigation. They searched the highway, interviewed some of her friends, tried to retrace Teresa's steps. The last time anyone saw her on campus uh, was around five or six o'clock, you know, just when it's getting dark, and somebody saw her outside the bus. She had missed the last bus. A bunch of 17, 18 year old kids, we all just said, oh, maybe she just took off. Maybe she decided to go camping. Maybe she decided to do this. Maybe she decided she was a free spirit. The college was only four or five years old. We were growing like, like leaps and bounds. I can say for certain that nobody had ever had this happen on their watch at another institution before. The things police were telling my parents were absolutely absurd, and they were, she's a runaway, she's gone back to Montreal. She's gotten pregnant and she's ashamed, so she's gone to a monastery. She's, she's joined a cult. My parents believed it. My dad went Saint Benoit de Lac, right? There's a, there's a monks. My dad knocked on the door. Police didn't. Now, they, the police said she might be at a place like that, did they investigate it? No. My dad knocked on the door of Saint Benoit de Lac and said, do you, are you, do you harboring a girl? The Allures hoped Teresa was alive. Local police wondered if she'd been abducted while hitchhiking, and the provincial police, the Sûreté du Québec, were slow to help because there was no body. Other theories began to gain more prominence. They began to bring, buy into the narrative. She was involved in illicit drugs. Well, Teresa had smoked some pot in her background, so 
maybe she was. He's like, well, what do you mean by she was involved? Well, was she running drugs? And you go, was she running drugs? I, I don't know. It seems a little far-fetched to me. She's been here for six, six weeks. Shocked by the theories and frustrated with the investigation, the Allures hired a private investigator. They just felt like that they were losing their minds. They had entered a parallel inverse universe where, where you know, where the normal rules uh, didn't apply anymore. Nine months earlier, a 12-year-old girl named Manon Dubay had disappeared and they had brought in the sniffer dogs. They had canvassed the area. They had, they had enlisted volunteers to go out and, you know, beat the bushes and, and look in the snowbanks and, and all of that. Now, I understand why you do that for a 12-year-old, but they hadn't bothered to do that for my sister. So immediately, because that wasn't being done, my father said, that's it. I'm, I'm going to get my own guy. The private investigator interviewed over a hundred students, faculty members, and staff. He even visited two Buddhist monasteries. The only items missing from Teresa's room were the clothes she was wearing and a book. No evidence that she'd packed up to leave, no evidence of any upheaval in her life. The most absurd one was Teresa was a lesbian and had gone somewhere where lesbians go to sort those things out. It was really a local Lennoxville case, but the Sarté du Québec was operating around the edges. So my, my father had contact with, with the, a lead guy, you know, in charge of the Bureau of Criminal Investigations, who early in November had advised my father. He said, Mr. Allure, look, these things sort themselves out. You go on home, the snow will melt and we'll probably eventually find her. My father said it was like a bullet going right through the center of his head when he heard that. After the break, a grisly discovery sends shockwaves through the community and propels the case in a whole new direction. Welcome back. Five months after a college student goes missing, a break in the case, but it's not the news the family was hoping for. We now return to Dan Spector and the search for Teresa Allure's killer. We had been back for Easter, April 13th, Friday the 13th, uh, 1979. We were having like a ham dinner at my aunt's early, maybe five o'clock. And the, uh, the phone rang and my dad got on the phone and things got very serious. The call was, you know, uh, a young girl's body has been found. Snow is melted. It's, it's April. It, we think it's your daughter. Uh, we'd like you to come to Quebec as soon as possible to make an identification. Initially, it's about them and, and the loss. But, and it was certainly that, but it is, it is the moment you realize that you have been given a life sentence to, you know, live without that person's influence and inspiration anymore. I definitely remember that, that it was Easter weekend um, when, when I got the call. I probably would not have cried in front of my family. Um, I know I, I retreated to my room and it was just complete disbelief that this is what happened to her. Teresa Allure's body, clad in just a bra and underwear, was found submerged in a drainage ditch on a farm off a country road less than three kilometers from her residence. Friday, uh, April 13th, 79, muskrat trapper comes here to set some traps and he finds Teresa's body just behind us. You know, it's devastating to hear that you've lost a friend, but it's even worse when they give you a description of how she was found. And then that's what is your last memory of your friend. We went back to Montreal, you know, very rapidly. And uh, so my father could make the identification. 
the body is in, in such a state of decomposition, you can't identify her. They use actually dental records to, to ultimately is what is used. And he's just, and, and my mom has said, he went in that door, one man, and he came out, and he's a change man, rest of his life. She was alone. So, and I still think about that today. What were her last moments like and how unfair that she never had a chance. After the body was found, the provincial police took over the case. Officers interviewed dozens of witnesses and took sworn statements from many who had seen her in the days and hours before she disappeared. But like the local police, they didn't treat this case like a homicide. Young woman, 19 years old, found in a bra and underwear, face down in a cornfield. What does that tell you? Circumstantially, it's suspicious to me, but the police almost immediately say, well, hold on, we have another idea. We may not be suspicious. Don't, don't get ahead of yourselves with sexual assault or murder or any of that thing. We, we have another idea. Didn't, didn't you say she recreationally, you know, would, would occasionally smoke pot or, you know, yes. Well, it's probably a drug overdose. Maybe some of her friends. She died in the residence of a drug overdose and they got spooked. So they, they packed up the body and they dumped it and, and they stashed the clothes and that's the end of it. Really, how did the wallet get 10 miles away from where the body was found? Oh, that's the kids too. They got in a car and they joy rid to Sherbrooke and they made sure they threw the wallet away. The line of questioning from, from the Sarté de Québec in those two weeks that they did a little work, to exclusively almost, 90% was to students, that's the only people they talked to, was, did, did you do drugs? And do you know that Teresa did drugs? Pot was as recreational as it, as it is today. Why would you even invest in that theory other than to blame the victim? It, it just didn't make sense. She really went there with a purpose. She did not go to party. She went to, to get an education, to, to grow up, to be independent. Sure, she drank, she probably still smoked pot. We all did at that time. But no, I, I remember hearing that and that sickened me. With police sticking to the drug overdose theory, the case didn't go anywhere for decades. Not buying the theory that his sister OD'd, John decided to look at the case with fresh eyes, his own. In 2002, I, you know, I partnered with Patricia Pearson, who I'd, I'd known you know, since high school. She, she had seen me growing up and my parents through that tragedy, so she'd observed it. We partnered and she wrote like a three, a, th a series of three articles for the National Post called Who Killed Teresa, which talked about Teresa's case and two other townships murders at that time and, and uh, caused a splash and got a lot of attention. John Allure is still seething. His sister's body was found along this muddy riverbank, half submerged, less than a mile from King's Hall, and no official search was ever launched for her. John and Patricia tried to find new clues, something police may have missed. The first time I came here was March 2002. I was standing right on the other side there with Patricia and Andre, and we were talking about it. And one of us, I think it was Patricia, said, this just said, this was a sex crime. And when she said it, like all the pieces fell into place. So you didn't think that until that moment? Uh, I think I had sus suspicions or things, but I hadn't really pieced it all together. I hadn't really figured it out. And it's our belief that my sister hitchhiked, uh, was picked up by an individual, uh, was taken back to the residence. The individual hung around, stalked her, eventually got her and killed her. He pressured police to reopen the case. Allure started chasing leads he felt police had ignored. He combed through old newspaper archives, re-interviewed witnesses. 
you know, there's a lot of people I looked into it and, and you know, the arena was, was vast. If, if, if somebody had a theory that it was a student, I'd look at every single student. Somebody had a theory that it was a teacher, I'd want to know what the background in every single teacher and on and on and on. There was certainly an issue with women and campus assaults, sexual assaults and rapes. In the wake of the National Post stories, all kinds of women came forward to me documenting not only here, but in this environment, Hatley and uh, Ayers Cliff and things like that, young, young women who were vulnerable, who, who were sexually assaulted, out jogging or, you know, waiting for a bus, all of that. I mean, many, many women came forward and, and tes testified to that. In fact, the very same day Teresa disappeared, an article in the Bishop's student newspaper described a woman being harassed by a naked man on the campus. It was far from the only such story around that time. I know of at least one defense attorney where we were asked to have his client list and it was made up of 25 different sexual predators. So that's just one attorney. I mean, multiply that by how many defense attorneys were working in the Sherbrooke Townships areas at, at, at the time. Coming up, John discovers something police failed to share with his family for years. Welcome back. Years after Teresa's death, the discovery of a coroner's report contradicts suspicion by police that her death was drug-related. We now return to the search for Teresa Allure's killer. A Montreal Gazette journalist obtained a document that made his jaw drop. On the day that she was found in this body of water, the, the coroner documented that he noted marks of strangulation around her neck. And that's in an official document, which was never shown to, to my, my parents. So this is the document, the coroner's report, which would have been filed uh, about four years um, after her body was found. And it sort of said very clearly, violent death of undetermined nature. This was shown to my family, this document, was never share, shared with my family. This is the same coroner, um, not four years later, this is Michel Durand on the day that the body was found. It's a little obscure, but it says here very clearly that they noticed marks of strangulation around her neck. The question is, if, if you're going to go with a drug overdose theory, um, what about this document? That shows me it's murder. I mean, that's, that's not speculation, that's an official document. To John, this was proof that drugs did not kill Teresa, but that's not all. When he and Patricia got a hold of this toxicological analysis, which police had in their possession within weeks of Teresa's body being discovered, it said there was no evidence of drugs in her system. Not only were there no drugs, there was no alcohol in her system. So how now, brown cow? What, what are you going to tell us now? For a long time, I thought it was simply incompetence. They're incompetent. They don't know how to do a criminal investigation. And then over time, I, I began to believe it was more than that, that it was deliberate obfuscation. Setting aside that belief, he started looking at other murders in the area. Manon Dubay went missing and was found in a stream not far from where Teresa was found. Okay, was it ever solved? No, it was not solved. Okay, aha. Uh -huh. Two. Anything else? Yes. March 1977, 24-year-old girl, Louise Camera, goes missing from downtown Sherbrooke, not far from Lennoxville. And she's found again on the outskirts. And, and all of them found to the south of Lennoxville, Sherbrooke. In, in Cameron's case, it is most definitely a, a murder. She's found with the lace of her, her boot around her neck. She's most definitely murdered and most definitely raped, strangled. So, okay, that's interesting. Was that solved? 
No, it's not solved. Aha, uh -huh. so that's three cases. I was trying to prove a theory. You know, at first it was to see, was there a serial killer? Was there one guy responsible for all of these things? John and Patricia had floated the idea of a serial killer being responsible for Teresa's death in their original newspaper reports and had been backed up by criminologist Kim Rosmo. We're talking Compton, we're talking Lennoxville, we're talking, you know, the Magog area where um, Cameron was found, we're talking Ayers Cliff where, where Menon Zubay was found, and we're talking Sherbrooke, you know, so this, this very vast area his predictor was that the offender, a serial sexual offender, lived in southeastern Sherbrooke in that area. And that, and that he urged police to look at the cases together, holistically, rather than looking at them independently. As Alor analyzed more and more murders of young women and girls he felt were similar to his sisters, he started to catalog them on his website, TeresaAlor.com. I had this opportunity to research the archives of Allo Police. Allo Police uh, was a French tabloid in the, in the, you know, in its heydays, really started in the 50s, co covered crime cases. And, you know, it had lurid photographs and um, really had the, the inside scoop. If you're a citizen detective, as I was rapidly seeing myself, this was fantastic. All these connections he was making made him realize there were other dissatisfied families out there. Before he knew it, he became their voice. On Friday, March 25th, Cameron's nude body was discovered in a snowdrift. On Sunday, April 17th, Houle's body is discovered about an hour north of Montreal. Helen was found naked except for her shirt, which was pulled up to her arms. You know, first I had 10, then I had 20. I was up to 30 or 40 cases that I was profiling. It didn't just happen to Teresa. There's all these other, you know, unresolved families where young women have been murdered and families have just been sort of dropped. So I started to profile them on, on my website to kind of say, hey, you, people need to pay attention to this. Coming up, frustrated that police seem to have again brushed aside his sister's case, John Allure discovers a disturbing pattern and goes on a mission to expose it. Welcome back. As Teresa's brother, John, advocates for a growing number of families of murdered women whose cases have gone cold. He discovers he is not alone in his pursuit of justice. We now return to the search for Teresa Allure's killer. I'd read about the death of Julie Boisvenu, who is uh, Pierre Hugues uh, Boisvenu's daughter. Pierre Hugues Boisvenu has been fighting for the rights of families of victims of violent crimes since his daughter Julie was kidnapped, raped, and murdered in 2002. I was reading in the United States about Pierre's activism. You know, he'd, he, he'd become very, very vocal about this and the mistakes made by police and, and by the justice system. His group, the Association of Families of Murdered and Missing Persons, has managed to have six laws changed. I called him up. I said, hey, you're, you're kind of impressive. John Allure knows he's looking for a needle in a haystack, a needle that might not even exist. He knows, but he's still here. John before that case and John after Teresa's death is not the same man. As Pierre Boisvenu, after the death of Julie, Pierre Boisvenu is not the same man. It's a man who has to, uh, to follow another path, another trail. I understand the frustration of John, but we have to remember that in that time, uh, we have very poor investigator, very poor technique. The idea that, wait a minute, I, I need to think the long game here and not think so much about the squeaky wheel of justice for my personal cause, which is my sister. 
John cannot change nothing about the drama of Teresa, but we can change some, something for other families. Allure brought awareness to the way evidence was treated by authorities. When the Allures had asked for physical evidence in Teresa's case to have it tested for DNA as that type of technology advanced, he was shocked to find out that would not be possible. They had destroyed the bra and the, the panties that she was found in within five years of her being found. If you speak to any criminal investigator, you know, if you ask them, how long do you keep it? The answer is, they, they look at you like you've lost your mind. They say, forever, dummy. Slowly, I was learning because I was befriending other victims' families that this, that this was not an uncommon thing. The Pryors, Sharon Pryor's 1975 murder, had evidence destroyed by the Longay police. Case in Laval had been destroyed. Montreal police, it had been destroyed. Today's episode is sort of a funeral for a friend. Uh, some months ago, I was contacted by a woman named Carol, and she said, uh, would you do a podcast on my best friend, Francine? She was murdered in the 80s. On Friday, October 18th, 1985, Francine Da Silva was out with a close friend, Joanne Page, in the Plateau neighborhood of Montreal. As soon as I saw his website, Who Killed Teresa, I knew it was something totally different. Nobody else was doing anything like that. I'm always thinking about Francine. I'm always thinking about her death. She was an amazing girl. Of course, everybody says that, but she really was. like. Everybody just loved her because she was just really, she was really fun and really funny and very generous. And they went to a bar and, because uh, they both really liked to dance. Then they decided to go for pizza at uh, Le Royale and saint Denis, which was so close. They walked home together down saint Denis. And when they got to Duluth Street, where Joanne lived, she asked Francine if she wanted to stay over that night, which Francine often did. Francine decided against it and headed home. Later that morning, two nursing students found Francine's body in the alley behind 902 Sherbrooke Street East. She had been stabbed and raped. I was at home. I'd just gotten home from work, whatever, and I heard the radio that, you know, women are done late hunting, was found dead. A few minutes later, the police were at the door knocking. After Carol first contacted me, I traveled to Montreal and I reviewed the Allo Police Archives, so I found two articles on Francine. The second Allo Police article focused on Raymond Charette. After Charette uh, was picked up at the advice of his attorney, he refuses to take a polygraph or to provide a blood sample. Newspapers at the time reported that Charette had been picked up as a material witness, but he was subsequently let go when police failed to produce evidence linking him to Francine's murder. Eventually, Charette is let go. Francine de Silva is forgotten. And the matter is never heard from again. He knows probably more than anybody about Quebec crime. So I really felt very lucky because he did a lot of work. You know the person understands how you feel and how you're... And I mean, his is way worse because they thought sister was missing. Like, thank God Francine was found right away. Like, people who are, have people missing for that amount of time, it's unbearable. While John worked to move cases like Francine's forward, he received a letter about a deathbed confession that might finally reveal Teresa's killer. Coming up... As a lore's advocacy bears fruit, a shocking deathbed confession changes 
who he believes is responsible for Teresa's death. Welcome back. After years of trying to solve his sister's murder, John believes he may have the answers. We now return to Dan Spector and the conclusion of the search for Teresa Allure's killer. So you had a, a biker war in the early 70s between the Jatans and the Adams. The clubhouse of the, the, the Adams was right up the road here uh, near Moe's River. So if you needed to get um, you, to the Adams Clubhouse, you had to pass by bishops or by, by, um, by King's Hall. John Allure had always wondered if the criminal underworld could have played a role in his sister's death. Biker gangs were a prominent part of the landscape in the eastern townships in the late 70s. Patricia Pearson and I wrote a book called Wish You Were Here, where we profiled a suspect named Luke Gregoire who has since deceased, he died in Archambault prison in 2015 for the murder of a young Calgary 7-Eleven clerk. Um, and Luke Gregoire grew up in the townships and fit the, the profile. Alora says one of his many case handlers over the years did look into Luke Gregoire. Eric Latour was just a Sartre de Quebec at the time, a detective who was assigned to my sister's case, but he, he really went to the hilt with a lot of things. He thought there was credibility in the Luke Gregoire thing. You know, kind of a, on his own initiative, flew out to Calgary to talk to Calgary police about what they had found out about Luke Gregoire. He had even gone to the lengths of, of putting um, a plant in Luke Gregoire's cell in Archambault to see if they, he could glean any information from Luke that he would say something, of, but he didn't. Allure even wrote to Gregoire in prison to ask him directly and received a denial from the convicted killer. But it was another letter he received after the publication of his book that changed everything. After that book was published, uh, a woman came forward. She first came to the police and told her story and then because the police didn't do anything about it, they, she came to me and told the story again. In 2017, Gerald Lachance was dying of cancer. He had just a few weeks to live. It was a story about how her father on his deathbed had confessed that, you know, he and his brother had picked up a young girl in Lennoxville and, and uh, you, you know, sexually assaulted and murdered her. When Gerald was about 19, which places this event in 1978, he was out driving with his older brother, Regis, and another man. Regis asked the driver to stop the car. He then dragged the girl with him. Some time passed. Gerald got out of the car to see what was going on. He says he was going to help the girl. Gerald went down in a field and found Regis holding the girl's head down in water. Without naming Teresa directly, they did give off, you know, a lot of elements and information that sounded very much like the murder of, of Teresa Lore. Alex said that their father, Gerald Lachance, confessed to one other murder of a girl they, quote, abducted at a convenience store in Sherbrooke. Who could this be, I wonder? Well, the only girl from Sherbrooke last seen at a convenience store that I know of is Louise Cameron. The woman had given the same statement to the Sarté de Quebec. I, I asked them, what do you think about this? And they were like, well, we think this woman is credible as well. So I do feel right now that's the most credible suspect, not the woman's father, but the brother. That brother, for a fact, at that time was a police informant. He was working for the Sarté de Quebec to help them process a case to put away a gang member in the Sherbrooke area at the time and close an investigation. Allure's belief is that police in that era tried to dismiss Teresa's case as a runaway, a drug overdose, in order to protect the real killer, an informant. 
they had bigger fish to fry in that area. You know, they were playing, they were playing cops and robbers. Senator Boivnu says the quality of police work has vastly improved in the decades since Teresa died. 40 years ago, we don't have the same kind of quality on investigation that we have today because we know that cases that are 30 or 40 years old, that they can solve it today with new kind of technique or DNA or everything like that. And by relentlessly pushing police to pursue new leads on Teresa's case and bringing light to hundreds of others, John has contributed to change. Amidst his advocacy, the Sûreté du Québec launched a cold case unit in 2004. And it wasn't just me pressuring them, it was people like Pierre Boivneau and others to do this. So they started a unit and I was very, very, very proud of that. I mean, congratulations, you have a cold case unit now. You've dedicated 25 to 30 officers to this cold case unit. You have a website with 300 cases on it. The SQ cold case unit website lists only one resolved case out of hundreds. The accused has still not gone to trial. Between 2004 and 2010, uh, John and I were very close on working on build, uh, also supporting families. We adopted in 2013 a, a bill that supports financially families when a relative has been missing or murdered. Uh, John worked with me on that bill. So we work very closely on many, many chains in Canada. If we don't do it, who will? Who John don't work in his own way, who will? He's done a lot in memory of Teresa, which is wonderful. I probably wouldn't let it go either. No, I probably would not let it go either. The only power we got is to speak on our own story to be sure that the victim will be more under understand. John stepping in and bringing a light to these cases is wonderful for these families. That's how I feel and I'm glad that he is doing it and it is painful and I'm sure for him it takes a lot of emotional and spiritual energy to do that. He's really put himself on the line emotionally. Like now he says he's going to stop and I really think he, he, he can and he should because I think he's really done enough. Will I continue to do this? As long as I find something interesting and I think it's compelling and that somebody else will find it interesting, I guess I will. Is this broadcast going to influence the police? I, I don't know that it is. Is it going to inspire someone else to to take up advocacy, I don't know. But I think they're worthy questions to tackle because murder is just a horrible thing. It, it confounds us, it scares us, it mystifies us. That's all for today. We're not done yet. That's not it, that's not the end. I can assure you, I'm not done. You wait until next time. This has been Who Killed Teresa? I'm your host, John Allure. The Sûreté du Québec declined a request for an interview, but through a spokesperson said any theory, no matter how absurd, would have been investigated and denied allegations that there was a cover-up to protect a police informant. John continued his pursuit of justice for Teresa and for the many families left traumatized by unsolved cases until the day he died. Just as this episode was being completed, he was killed in a tragic accident, fatally struck by a car while cycling. He tried to maintain balance in his life and found peace biking through the countryside near his home in North Carolina. He is survived by his three daughters, one of whom is named Teresa. She posted this on John's Facebook page. I want to say more about how great he was, how funny, and how much my sisters and I loved him. But I don't have the words right now. Thank you for keeping my family and my father in your thoughts. And upon hearing of his death, John's friend, Senator Pierre-Hug Boisvenu, had this to say. John was more than a friend. We called each other brother because we had this mission tattooed in our hearts. I have a lot of pain because I love this fighter who never gave up trying to find his sister's killer. Tonight, he finally knows the truth. Rest in peace, my dear friend.